Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas and we do post every week so do hit subscribe if you want to follow our continuing horticultural adventures. Stephen, didn't we already do the monocarp story? <laughs> yes we did. We're, we're actually not going to be talking about monocarps today, we're going to be talking about marginal plants uh -huh. for ponds. I wondered but... why the pointless jetty was behind us. It's not pointless, it's pointing at us. <laughs> Anyhow, we've done that as well we and have. i've explained we why have. the jetty is good as well so there's going to have to be a few links going here but this is the giant carrot from madeira that is a monocarp so it dies after flowering and this one is doing exactly what it's meant to do it's died after flowering and covered in seed there but that's go. that's an aside another story we'll yeah. link the monocarp story below but we are by your pond yes because Every time I walk around it, there is something that catches my eye. Mm. So we've decided to put together a little profile about margin plants, plants yeah. that literally grow on the edge of water. Yeah, so not things that are submersible like a water lily, mm. but something that will grow in the sort of muddy banks or even out into the water fractionally, which softens off the whole edge of a garden. And, and we actually hear frogs in the background going, No, that's a kookaburra. Is it? Yeah. Here they go. Isn't that a frog as well, though? Oh, there might be one in the background, but that's kookaburras, folks, for those of you who aren't in Australia. Our laughing jackasses, as they're sometimes known. Well, they're very happy. We'll have to shout over the kookaburras. So are we, can we call these plants aquatic? No, because that's something that lives in, in water or on water. Yeah, right. yeah. So I, I would just use the term marginal. I think that sort of explains it reasonably well. I love it. Living on the margins. We all live know. on the edge. <laughs> well, should we go and see a few things that are living on the edge, Stephen? Why don't we do that? It would be a good idea and we might as well do it right now. Let's. All right. Well, the first marginal cab off the rank. This is glorious. Is it a ginger? No. No. It, it's not. It's a canner. A canna lily. It yes. cannot be a canna lily. It is a canna lily. This plant actually proves that not all canna lilies are gaudy. No, because viewers, I'm not a lover of canna lilies. Yeah, I know yeah. you've got a lot. Yes, yes. I love them because I like their... You like vulgarity, you, flashy gaudiness, Stephen. Honest <laughs> vulgarity, I have to say. As opposed to dishonest <laughs> vulgarity. Yeah. And this one is quite different. It's very elegant and it's monochrome too, which in a mm. canna... I like. Yes, so this one is called Canna Glauca, mm. which means that it has glaucous foliage, i.e. slightly grey or blue. Oh, is that uh, what Glauca means? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So there you go. And it has these very, very pretty, narrow petaled butterfly-like flowers on the top of the stem. It can grow to two, two and a half metres tall if it's mm. in a, a spot where it's really happy. Mm. And I started this off years ago from one seed that I got from Great Dixter Garden in England oh. from Christopher Lloyd's Sunk Garden. It was actually growing in a pot, sunk into the pond. Mm. So the stems were actually slightly below water level and it was flourishing. Uh, I did collect the seed with permission, by the way, just in case somebody's interested in knowing that. And so uh, this is sort of, I see this almost as a souvenir of my trip to England. How wonderful. Uh, and it is a great plant. It will grow out into the water as well as growing up the bank a bit. So yep. it's very happy to go either way. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly needs plenty of sun. Most cannas are sun loving. As long as it's got adequate moisture, it, it will thrive almost anywhere. Now, is this a species or a hybrid? This is a wild species. Yeah, where's so, it from? Well, it apparently comes from South Carolina all the way down through the Caribbean and down into tropical America. Otherwise known as quite hot slash tropical, we are not in the tropics. No, we're not. But it but seems to be thriving. It does. And of course, the thing about cannas being herbaceous perennials, mm. uh, they have a tendency to disappear below ground level in ah. the winter. So they will actually tolerate much lower temperatures than if they were a shrub or a tree that was in the same conditions. But do you think at Great Dixter they would have taken that pot and put it in the greenhouse over I, winter? I would feel fairly confident that that's what they used to do. They mm. would have taken it out. They would have overwintered it in their greenhouse or... They may have even taken out tubers and overwintered them in a box of sand in the, in the cellar. Who knows? Mm. But yes, they would have been taken out uh, and put in a protected spot. Because I don't imagine it's a marginal plant that if the water were to freeze or the ground to freeze, it's probably not going to cope with that, do you think? Uh, look, I think it would cope with it better than if it was something growing out in a border because with the ice on the top of the water, the water underneath isn't going to be as cold. Mm. And in fact, the ice layer may well, in fact, put a protective layer over it. So it could, in fact, survive in the pond. It, all its top would be taken off, but that would happen anyway. Yeah. And so it could actually survive underwater uh, in colder areas. Now, we are sort of mid-ish autumn, and it seems to me to be in full floral glory. Is this when it flowers? It's a later flower? 
No, it actually will normally start a little after midsummer, so yeah. here around about Christmas time. Yeah. This year it's been a rather reticent plant because we've had a very cool summer, so it's only really started to hit its full straps now. But the flower stems will finish uh, and you can take the whole flowered stem out mm. uh, and there'll be no, more coming up. So as long as we the frosts stay off, the plant will keep growing and flowering. For the season. Uh -huh. yeah. Now, this isn't a particularly big clump. Do you control it or is it is it a fast spreader? Could it be weedy? Can it uh, you know, all run those amok? questions? <laughs> Anything can run amok, I guess. But the way I'd look at it is that it's a moderately quick spreader because it has rhizomes that go out quite away from the original stem. Mm. So in pots, certainly when I grow it in pots, it hits the sides of the pots very quickly mm. uh, and comes up around the outside of the pot. So it does spread reasonably fast. But having said that, because the water here is quite deep, it's not going to go out into the water very far. Mm. And because it's really dry at the top of the bank, it's not going to enjoy coming up to the top all uh -huh. that much. But it is running along, so it's grown up through my gunnera and it is working its way around, but it won't grow back into the shade either. So it's sort of being naturally controlled. Self-managed, yep. yeah. So most canna lilies we're familiar with in perennial beds, yeah. and you did mention that some marginal plants, as long as they're moist, can be in a, in a bed. What about this one? Can this yep. not be near water? Oh yes, yeah. so it could stay in an ordinary garden bed as long as it had adequate irrigation. That's the only thing. So uh, yeah, it would be just as easy as any of the others, but there's a couple of different water canna species, and there's a few hybrids from them now. Mm. Um, and although even the ordinary canna can be actually submerged partially in water, these ones seem to revel in it. There you go. Well, on to the next marginal plant. What a good idea. Now, this has got beautiful foliage. It's a fabulous plant. It goes under the name of Persicaria. Ah, yes. And this particular species is one called Microcephala. Which Microcephala. Means micro meaning small. Head. Cephala meaning head. <gasps> yeah. Microcephala. There you go. And it's a cultivar called Red Dragon. I wonder why. Yeah, because it has red in the leaves, of course. Now, it's a bulky perennial. It takes up quite a bit of space, so you need to allow it a little bit of room. Mm. But it's one of those plants that um, its best foliage is on its very new growth. So early in the spring, it comes up really burgundy, almost beetroot red. Yeah. Uh, and then the foliage tends to fade a bit as the season goes on. Mm. Then in the autumn, you get these little white flowers, which are pleasant enough, but not mm. overly important. Mm. What I sometimes do with this time allowing is that when it starts to get up quite big and starts to lose some of the burgundy in the leaves mm. so that could be you know sort of early summer yeah i cut the whole plant back again and start it off from the bottom again so by midsummer you've got the burgundy leaves again all the yeah. new growth yeah exactly ah. so and i reckon if you had the time and energy you could do that two or three times during the growing season and keep bringing up the beautiful burgundy foliage so you've got what looks like a few Sort of relatively new yep, burgundy there is, green stems. Yep. Uh, so they're later ones that have come up. So because it has that growth pattern where it can keep growing right through the season, given a reasonably moist aspect, then in fact you could easily trim it several times a year and just keep using that beautiful foliage. Now did you say, is it a herbaceous perennial or a perennial? It's, a herb, it's herbaceous or semi-herbaceous I guess. In warmer climates it tends not to die down below ground completely, mm. but in cool climates it's likely to get knocked right down. So talking of which then, can you grow this, could you grow this in Britain, in oh, yeah. North America? Easily. In colder winter, areas oh, yeah. of colder winters? Yep, it will grow perfectly well. It'll be a little more herbaceous than it is here. I have to push it down in the winter. Mm. And even then when I take all the old stems off, it's normally got a few of the lovely burgundy leaves coming up from the bottom again anyway. So it's never completely below ground level in my climate. Mm. And where are Persicarias from or is it widely spread? There's a fairly broad range with, uh, that the genus comes from. Yeah. But this particular one comes from sort of the Himalayan region through into southern China and that ah. area. Uh, but there's some pernicious weeds in the family. Uh, there, As the rule always are. Yeah, nearly always. Get out. Vietnamese mint is also in this is it group. Yes, it's in the same group I as well. I didn't know that. So there's a whole range of different ones. And the genus has been split up and blocked back together again, and all sorts of things ha have happened over the years. Yeah. I think in my time, 
these plants have gone through about two or three or maybe even more name changes over that period. So it's a little hard to keep up sometimes. Nonsense, that's mm. all nonsense. Now, this is a program about marginal plants and this is on the margin of your pond. Yep. So in its natural habitat, is that where it grows? It would grow and in it, swampy ground. Yes. Swampy ground. Yep. Yep. Um, and can you, like the canners, grow this in a bed that was moist enough or does it need to be near Oh water? no, it could, it could easily grow in a bed that's just got adequate moisture. It doesn't need to be in a bog or on the edge of a, a pond. Mm. Uh, it can grow really well in a large pot and you can always put the pot in a saucer of water for the summer so that it's got that little bit of extra water. It's a very amenable plant. Yeah. And I might add, almost embarrassingly easy to propagate. <laughs> <laughs> and yours is this, this is full sun this yeah this fairly bit. full sun mm. in, in the shade it tends to lose its burgundy a bit so you don't really want to encourage that it does it mm. on its own even in the sun so keep it in a reasonably open sunny spot yes and i can see the bees are loving the flowers in autumn too yes yes it does give them a food source later in the year all right on to the next marginal plant why not indeed now this could be a matter of big is better i'm not quite sure Many of you are aware of a genus called Oryngium, the sea hollies. They tend to be smaller plants, they tend to like well-drained soil, they tend to be things that uh, are herbaceous perennials, but there's a race of them that come from South America, and this is one of them, Oryngium pandanifolia, meaning leaves like a pandanus palm, which is evergreen and seems to like moisture. I've seen it in the wild growing in sort of semi-boggy conditions. And you have these long strappy leaves, which are a bit bitey, I have to say, <laughs> uh, and these enormous big flower spikes with these tiny little flower heads on it. And this form uh, with its purple flowers is the superior form, of course. So uh, it is uh, one I raised from seed years ago that I got from England and at the time it was said to be a special form that came from the Chelsea Physic Garden. So I don't know whether it's been given a name since, it probably has, but I just call it my Chelsea Physic Garden form. It's growing here in the edge of the pond virtually. Some of the crowns have actually worked their way out into the mud uh, and it is flourishing. I used to have it in a part of the garden here where it grew where there was no water to speak of and it grew fine, but it kept a lot of dead foliage in the plant and never flourished. And I have lost it in really dry spots. So although it looks like a plant that almost belongs in the desert, it's fantastic as a marginal plant around a pond. So these plants, the spiky leafed evergreen oryngiums, all come from South America. So they come from sort of Peru through Chile, all those sorts of areas of the world. And they really are remarkably different sea hollies. Marginal plants, Stephen, that was very interesting. Now, the oryngium, now I'm used to those kind of those holly, she holly things yeah. that you grow in perennial beds that are cut flowers. That is so different. And to me, that looked like a weird bromeliad. It does rather look like that, mm. but it gets worse because- <laughs> No. Yes, it does. The oryngiums yeah. are in the same family, believe it or not, as mm. the carrot. A carrot? A carrot. They're in the Apiaceae family. So they are somewhat related to the garden carrot. <laughs> so there you go. It does get worse. Very, very distantly. Well, that was very interesting because um, none of those things I would have thought of, particularly this oryngium, to be a marginal water plant. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. What could we do next week, Stephen? Well, it could be marginal plants too, but probably well, not. Summer. Yeah, no. <laughs> but we will revisit them again. I mean, we've covered three. I mean, that's just a tiny amount. So yeah. we'll probably come back and visit that again at some point. And there are lots in your garden and you have got uh, one, two, well, two bodies of water? Two major bodies of water plus a small pond and, and lots of bird baths and things around. So mm. yeah, so we will revisit that at some point or another. We will. And we'll also link the water feature playlist so you can see all the other ponds that Stephen has in his garden. Well, next week, who knows what it will be? but you'll have to subscribe if you want to know exactly what it is because we post every week yes. to follow our continuing adventures. And we will see you all next week. See you next week.